Cool. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our next speaker, uh, this is, no pressure, his first time giving a presentation outside of school. So just, no pressure at all, but uh, I told him he's going to skate right through. It's a, you get it? It's a, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a, I'm hungover. Uh, anyway, everybody, Calvin, Calvin, everybody. So, uh, like you said, this is my first conference talk, so you have the dubious honor of being my first presentation audience. I'm not sure whether that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. Jury's still out on that. Uh, hopefully, that's up for you guys to decide. And in case you missed it, um, the skate pun was a, was a joke because I am a speed skater. I spend more time in an ice rink than I do behind my keyboard, which is saying a lot. Um, I, if I'm not here, you can find me in an ice rink. But anyways, my talk is called Moving Past Metasploit, Scripting Your Way Out of Being a Script Kitty. And this is something that I see with a lot of InfoSec people, a lot of technical people in general. Um, they tend to focus on using a lot of pre-built tools. Uh, we don't always write our own tools because we don't have the knowledge to or we don't have the time to. But writing your own tools is a good way to learn more. It's a good way to improve your workflow, and it's a good way to be more valuable. But first off, a little bit about me. Um, I'm on Twitter at 001Spartan. Uh, I'm a noob and or a student, depends who you ask. Um, I'm also a speed skater. That's a picture of me and my gear uh, when I'm about to get on the ice. And I'm a pen testing intern at Hurricane Labs. It's been around two months or a month and a half or so. And I'm enjoying the hell out of that. They're letting me do a lot of really cool stuff. And I really appreciate that. So first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this talk is, then who it's for. Uh, I'm going to go through why tools are good, why tools are bad. And then I'm going to use the example of writing an exploit, a simple buffer overflow exploit, as a good example of how writing your own tools can help you learn and it can help you uh, explore things that maybe you haven't explored before. And then uh, after that, I'm going to talk about what you can take away from this as a security professional, as a security student, uh, what you can hopefully glean from my talk. Uh, still, that remains to be seen. Uh, so if you're a red team person, writing your own tools is a very important skill. It's not just about using Metasploit, using Autopone so that you can get into boxes because writing your own tools is very helpful. It makes you, it helps you write utilities that you will use on a daily basis. Um, I have written tools that I use constantly uh, because they do things better or they do things that other tools don't quite get. Um, it lets you be smarter about the way you work. It lets you uh, do little things that you'd like to see, but you haven't seen in any other tools. If you create your own, it does whatever you want it to. And it's a good way to build your skill set. When you're going through and writing the stuff, you have to learn more about the systems you're working with. You have to learn more about the technologies you're working with. And it gives you that extra knowledge. And it increases your value. If you write more tools, you have more skills. And if you have more skills, companies want to hire you. If you're a blue team sort of person, a defensive sort of person, it lets you, writing your own tools can help you control your environment more. It can help you save time. And it will also help you build knowledge about your system and provide more value to your employer, which hopefully is what we all want to do. I doubt anybody here wants to provide less value for their employer. <laughs> and if you're a noob or a student, um, Writing tools is a great way to learn. You can learn more about operating systems. You can learn more about protocols. You can learn a lot about security just by writing your own tools. If you have to write something to interpret HTTP or if you have to write an interface to FTP or something like that, you'll learn a lot about those protocols while you do it. That's why um, I try and emphasize with other people that I'm talking to that it's important to build that knowledge to get that experience. Even if you write something that's terrible, and it's crap and nobody would ever want to use it. It's important to get that so that you can build that knowledge up, so that you can start to write things that are actually useful rather than just being for practice. 
And if you're anything like me, your tools directory probably looks a lot like this. If you're a red team person, you probably recognize a lot of those tools. If you're a blue team person, I don't have any of those logos up there. But th this, this is generally what a lot of my uh, setups look like. I've got tons of different tools. All of them do different things. Some of them duplicate functionality a lot. But I'm overwhelmed with the amount of tool, uh, with the number of tools that I can choose from. And choosing the right one can be a pain. But a lot of these have very useful features and things like that. But so let's talk about some of the good things that you can do with tools. One thing is that it lets you be lazy. If you don't have to work hard, why bother? You can be lazy and you can do your job while you're, while you're at it. If you're lazy, you don't have to burn yourself out as much. You don't have to stress about, uh, how do I do this? Things like that. Metasploit is a very, very useful tool for that. You don't have to worry about writing your own exploits all the time. You can use these pre-built things that would otherwise be way too hard for you to write yourself. Um, I can't write most of the exploits I use. I can write some of them, but I am nowhere near qualified to write a lot of them. So that's one of the really good things about um, using tools. Another thing is that it takes less time to test things and it gives you more time to break things if you're a red team person. If you're a blue team person, it gives you more time to analyze your environment, to make sure everything's operating well, and you don't have to worry about um, how to get the results you need. You can just focus on what you do with those results. And they have more or better features, although sometimes more features and better features are mutually exclusive. Um, some, sometimes they aren't, but at times they are definitely at odds with one another. Um, and it, these tools that we use, if they're mature enough, if they're uh, well-rounded enough, um, they can be a lot more reliable than uh, the script that your sysadmin from 15 years ago wrote. Nobody knows how it works, but you still use it because it's the only thing that does your job properly. Uh, so hopefully this talk will give you some ideas on why that's important to avoid and why that's a, why that's a bad thing. And so that's a little bit about how tools can be good, but they can also be bad. Uh, the first thing that's bad about them is that they make you lazy. They make you uh, stagnant. They don't build your skills after you start using a tool that does everything for you. Um, it's the classic example of a script kitty tool, Metasploit. It's used by professionals, but it's also used by people who don't know what it's doing behind the scenes. Um, I use Metasploit a lot, but a lot of people look down upon it as a script kitty tool because it's so easy to use. It makes you lazy. If you have a tool that does that for you, you don't need to, you don't need to do it for yourself. You don't need to think about what's going on. You don't need to think about why you're using it. You just, uh, do the auto pwn and you get shells and everybody's having a good day until something doesn't work. And that's where opacity comes in. These tools can be really opaque if you don't know what the technologies you're dealing with uh, are actually doing. They can be really hard to understand if you don't take a look at what's happening under the hood, so to speak. If they're closed source, it's hard to do that. If they're open source, sometimes the code is so bad that it's still just as hard to do that. And um, some of these things can have a lot of security issues. A common PHP shell was the C99 shell, and it was discovered to have a backdoor in it, a pretty blatant one. So that's one of the major issues. You can have security issues in these really popular tools that even if you, even if it, they are open source, it's still very hard to detect or nobody's looking at it because everybody's just lazy. Nobody wants to do code audits on open source tools. <laughs> that's why we have Heartbleed. That's why we have Shellshock. Nobody wants to do that. So. That's one of the issues with using tools that you just download off the internet and random things that you find. Um, and another aspect of that is side effects. A lot of these things will have side effects. If you're familiar with run running exploits on boxes, sometimes you end up with blue screens. And when you're pen testing production servers, that's not such a good idea. Um, or if you're if you're trying to uh, get a shell on a box and you're using your handy-dandy uh, Russian 
web shell that you found on some third party uh -huh. website or hack forums or something like that. This shell is super awesome. It's got all these cool features. Oh, the developers of the shell really like it too because it drops them a shell every time you use it. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, ramific ramifications to consider when you're using those stuff, those things. And uh, uh, one of the things that I find most annoying is a lot of these things can be bloated. Um, there is a certain popular penetration testing framework that may or may not take five minutes to start up because it's so much stuff in there. Uh, even though it's a very useful tool, it takes a long time to start up and that can be really annoying and you can't have you're wasting resources on stuff that you don't need because it's got all these extra features. So that's some of the bad stuff. And as you can see, the good and the bad are both kind of intermingled. You can't have one without the other. So it's important to know when you need to give up and actually start using a tool that somebody else has written, when that's a smarter idea, or when it's important to take a step back and say, hey, I could write something better. I could do it better, I could make it more secure, I could make it less bloated, and it could do exactly what I want to. So that's why you should write your own. Only the features you want, you can match your workflow. If you've got a super awesome tiling window manager and you want to have everything integrated with that, you want to have it automatically generate reports in the exact format that you want, you can write your own features and it can do exactly it can do things in exactly the way you want it to do things. You aren't constrained by some developer in Germany who says, no, I only want my tool to do this stuff. And if you don't want it to do that stuff, too bad. Because you get to be that guy. You get to tell other people, no, it does what I want it to. It does what I need it to and nothing else. But the most important thing about that is to learn how stuff works. Because when you're writing stuff, you learn about your networks, you learn about protocols, you learn about operating systems, you learn about attacks. If you're a red team guy and you're writing your own packet capture tool just for fun, or you're writing your own port scanner just for fun, you learn about a lot about how networking works. You can look at TCP, you can look at UDP, you can look at all the, uh, all the different protocols you're using. You can write your own FTP client. That's a really easy way to get more interested in things like that and gain more knowledge. You can learn about operating systems if you're writing exploits or if you're trying to write scripts to automatically harden a Linux box or something, for instance. Uh, doing that is a good way to learn more about how the operating system works. You can learn about how SE Linux works and why it won't let you write in a certain folder even though you have permissions to it or why why your web server isn't working quite right. So if you're writing scripts to automatically do that for you, it's a great way to really cement that knowledge in your head, to really get that foundation and plant it in your brain. because. If you're like me, you learn very much by doing things and reading it out of a textbook or reading it out of uh, techsupporttips.com or something like that uh, doesn't give you that knowledge. It's kind of a passive way to learn these things when you're actually doing it, when you have to put stuff into code, whether it's a bash script or a batch file or uh, just writing Python or something like that, that really cements that knowledge in your brain. And last but certainly not least, it's a good way to have fun if you're as much of a geek as I am. And seeing as you're all at a security conference on a Saturday uh, in the end of July, you probably are as much of a geek as I am. So it's a great way to have fun. It's a great way to explore these things. And yeah, have fun doing it. So the example I'm going to use of something that I went through that really helped me learn a lot more about things is um, writing a basic buffer overflow exploit. And I'm going to be using an example from an intentionally vulnerable virtual machine called BrainPan. It's available on vulnhub.com, and it's a VM that's running a vulnerable network accessible service. And that service has a vulnerability leading to a very trivial buffer overflow. But if you haven't explored a buffer overflow before, it's a great learning experience because it's easy enough to execute, it's easy enough to get this working that you can do it without in an afternoon, even if you've never took, taken a look at a buffer overflow before. It's a really fun exercise and it's a really easy thing to do.
So the steps that we're going to go through are first, you got to find the crash. You got you have to find a service that you can make do something unexpected. Uh, and w if you're looking at something like SQL injection, that's going to be putting a tick in a field and suddenly the server spits out an error and you know there's a vulnerability. In the case of a buffer overflow, generally that looks like putting too much data in. You yell at it with a bunch of A's until it crashes and then you say, hey, something happened here. Let's see what I can do with that. So after you find a crash or whatever unexpected error, you need to analyze the behavior of that error. You need to take a look at what's going on, see if you can exploit it, and then go ahead and actually build that exploit so that you can then make use of that exploit to gain control over the system in this instance. And then you own the box and you can do whatever you want, whether that's changing their background to I, I love my little pony or playing a silly audio file over their speakers or grabbing the data that your client wants you to get to. But first, let's talk about what a buffer overflow actually is, uh, because I'm not sure if everybody here understands the concepts behind it. And it's important to go through things when you're learning like this. You have to start with the basics. What is a buffer overflow? So uh, if you want a really great explanation that's also very old, uh, I was three years old when it came out, um, <laughs> there, yeah, no problem. <laughs> So there's this article that was originally in FRAC called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit by Aleph One, and it goes through the basics of how memory works, how uh, C works, and what a buffer overflow is. And it's also called stack smashing. And the basic principle is you're putting too much data into a fixed length buffer. So you have a certain buffer of a certain size, and you're cramming too much data into that. So you get to write outside of the bounds that you would normally have access to. And this exists because C is not a memory safe language. C doesn't care if you write outside that buffer if you use a certain functions. And that is what leads to that unexpected behavior when you yell at your program a bunch. Uh, it, you cram so much data in there that it can't contain it within the buffer. And you start actually overwriting the assembly uh, of the program itself. You start overwriting the program that's executing the code. And that's where you get some really cool behavior. And that really cool behavior is what lets you break it. So I've got a really simple example right here. I'm going to point to it with my cursor. So we've got a function. Uh, our function is called func. And it takes a string as input. And what it does with that string is we have a buffer of 12 characters right here. So this buffer is only supposed to have 12 characters. In memory, it has space for exactly 12 characters, no more. Uh, you can put less in, but it'll just fill that with zeros. So what happens is this line uh, right here, if I can see my cursor, this line copies the input string and puts it into the buffer. What's important to realize here is it doesn't check to see if this string is too long. Whoops, went too far. It doesn't check to see if this string is too long. It just cares that you have a string there and that you're putting it into the buffer. It will happily copy over gigabytes of data into your string if you have memory for that. It doesn't really care. It'll overwrite your entire memory uh, address space for that program. It really doesn't care because string copy doesn't uh, doesn't protect memory at all. It will let you write as much data as you want. So what happens if you put too much data in there? You get something that looks like this, a seg fault. And we are telling the program that if I can f put enough data in there, I will put enough data in there. If I can put too much data in there, I will put too much data in there. That cat doesn't care. He will just sit in that basket. It doesn't matter if he fits or not. And we're going to do that to this program. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my Kali machine. And we have a simple little Python script. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I'll change my colors here. There, that should be a little more legible. So we've got a simple little Python script. This is 12 lines of Python. It's nine lines if you take out the blank spaces. That's how easy it is to trigger one of these things. You don't have to know a ton. You don't have to know anything about how assembly works to do this. It's just as simple as 
uh, creating this short little Python script. And I'm going to actually walk through it line by line because it, I want to show you what my thought process was, how I learned what was happening here. So first off, this import statement, we're just importing sockets so that we can work through, uh, so that we can send data and receive data over the network. This is how we're going to send data to the vulnerable program and analyze what happens. Then, this is the data that we're actually going to be transmitting, this buff variable. We're going to be transmitting this slash x41, which, if you don't know, uh, hex is the ASCII code for A in hex encoded format. And we're not just going to send one of these. We're going to send a thousand of them because we want to make things break. We want to see if what happens if we stuff too much data in there. So we create our socket. Um, we're just telling it uh, what type of socket it is, how we want to be able to access that. And then we're going to go and have it connect to the host. This is the Windows 7 VM that I'm running the vulnerable service on. And this is the port. I'm pretty sure everybody here would be familiar with how that works, how we're going to actually connect to it and send data. And we're going to wait for a response first because the program will send us, excuse me, the program will send us a little bit of a login page and it'll ask for a password. So we got to send that, or we got to get that response first and then we're going to send our data right here, these two lines. We're going to send a certain, the 1,000 bytes of data to the service, which is called BrainPan. And we're going to see what happens with this receive line right here. And over here on my beautiful Windows 7 machine, um, we have the service running. It's listening on port 9999, uh, 9999, and it will wait for connections. Once we connect to it, let's see what happens when we run this Python script. So we're going to do Python. So you see here, it gives us our login uh, login prompt thing, and then we send 1,000 bytes of data to that. And what happens? It looks like it crashed to me. And if you look here, it's screaming at us. It's going, ah, all over the place <laughs> until it eventually just dies. And it crashes hard. It doesn't handle the error. It doesn't handle the error at all. It just dies. So let's restart that because I'm going to need that again. But we found a crash. It says connection reset by peer because it crashed and it closed the socket and it killed everything. The next step is after the, after the crash. Uh, two different kinds of crashes. Neither one there are the ones we're talking about. But I liked putting pictures in because I thought that white text on black slides was too boring. So I need some pictures, right? <laughs> So then we need to figure out if it's repeatable. And is it repeatable? Well, let's go over here and find out. Yeah, it crashed again. It's repeatable. We can do it again. We can do this all day. It'll happen again just like that. It'll keep going. <laughs> it's repeatable. Then we need to ask ourselves, is it reliable? Does it constantly affect the program in the same way every time? Or if it doesn't affect the program in the same way, does it have some sort of behavior that we can exploit so that we can get ourselves into some type of sane uh, environment in the stack? The stack is what holds the program memory. We need to have that be somewhat sane every time we exploit it. Because if it corrupts our data completely, we can't use that to actually write an exploit. We can't actually use that to gain control. After we determine whether or not it's reliable, we need to determine if we can control execution, which means can we tell the computer to do what we want after we exploit this? When you're writing over the program code of a certain, of a given service, you're writing over code, you can put your own assembly in there and your assembly will get executed just like any other code would. The program can't tell a difference. It doesn't know you jumped out of that buffer because C is stupid. It doesn't care. It just does what you tell it to. And if you're telling it to do bad stuff, it'll do bad stuff. Computers are really cool that way. They do whatever I ask them to do, even if that's not what the owners want them to do. <laughs> but so we need to figure out if we can control that, if we can actually get it to do what we want it to do. And after that, we need to see if we can ex uh, if we can exploit that because sometimes you'll have behavior that seems like it's exploitable, but there's some little bit of stuff wrong. There's some memory protection in play on the OS. There's some 
uh, there's some sort of error there that will make it so that we can't actually exploit it even if all the conditions are right. So let's go ahead and I've got another couple scripts here. This is how we determine the offset. The offset is important because as you write over memory, eventually you'll reach the addresses that are being held in the computer's registers. The registers are what keep track of things. They keep track of the total address space of the program. They keep track of where you are in the stack. They keep track of what program is being executed, uh, of what of what code is being executed. That's what we want to determine with this big chunk of data right here. This is just a repeating pattern that's generated uh, by a Metasploit tool. <laughs> I know it's Metasploit, but uh, you can't get away from it entirely. Uh, it's very, very helpful. Um, but this is a repeatable string that contains no repetitions of tiny little byte patterns. So every four byte pattern is completely unique. And that will tell us the exact offset of a certain register. The register we want to control is EIP, which is the in instruction pointer. Because what EIP does is that tells the, the CPU what instruction to execute next. If we can control that, we can tell it the exact instruction we want to execute it. And then we can tell it to execute our code because we want our code on their computer. It doesn't matter if they don't want their code on our their computer because uh, as a red team guy, I want my code to run on anyone's computer. <laughs> and so that's what this will tell us. And if we run this one, I'm going to make sure this service is running. If we run this one, I decided not to have a debugger in this talk, but uh, you go through and you will see in this window right here that our data is posted to that server and it gets it. And at some point in the program, you will see that there is a crash. And if you look at that in a debugger, it will tell you exactly where the program execution pauses when it crashes. And that exact state tells you where you need to inject your code. It tells you where you need to put the instructions to do what you want it to. And that will tell you the offset. In this case, the offset is 524. So 524 bytes, and then our code gets executed. So I have another script that will show that. It would be more effective with a debugger, but uh, I was using the debugger for a different presentation and I didn't want to get quite as in-depth because I didn't want to bore everybody. Uh, I know that looking at debuggers isn't everybody's favorite pastime, uh, as much as it might be for some of us. Um, but in this case, I printed out 524 characters of A, the slash x41, then I put pwned, and then I put a couple hundred characters of slash x42, which is a capital B. And what that tells us is if the program pauses and the EIP register is pointing at our four characters, this pwned, we know that we have execution, or we know that we have the right offset and that we can control the program flow after that. So it probably won't look like much here, but I'm going to run it anyways because I have it. Uh, this one. So it sends a couple hundred bytes, and you will see here that it's yelling at us a bunch. And then we have these four characters here, and this is what the instruction pointer is going to point at. This is what the next code that the computer is trying to execute will point at. And it's trying to execute pwned right now, which doesn't mean anything to the computer. It generates some assembly, but it doesn't mean anything that will actually do what we want. That's just a proof of concept to show that we can get it in the right place. And this program doesn't use any st sort of uh, ASLR or DEP or anything, so we can execute whatever we want. We don't have any restrictions there. Uh, bypassing that is kind of out of scope. But so it crashes again, and if you were looking at it in a debugger, you would see that it crashes exactly the way we want it to, that those four characters are put exactly where we want them to be, and we can own the machine from there. So then I've got this one, where I actually added shellcode. 
And what shell code is, is it's code that will give you a shell of some sort, or it's just code that will do something to show that we control the system and that we can exploit it. In this case, our shell code will drop a listener, or a reverse shell to us, and it will show that after we exploit this program, we have control over the computer and we can make it do what we want. And I generated that using another Metasploit tool called MSF Venom, um, and that allows us to use predefined payloads that are in Metasploit, because Metasploit payloads are pretty cool, even if you don't like the rest of the framework, and that will drop us a shell when we run our code. So we have to start our service again. This one doesn't recover nicely from crashing, so we can't just let it keep going. And I will start a netcat listener. Um, port 4444, because that's the best port. And I will run this Python script. We're sending 979 bytes. Let's look over here. And you will notice that it didn't crash this time. It spews a bunch of garbage out, but it didn't crash. That's really cool, because now we know that we can get it to do stuff without crashing. If we look over here at our listener, we are now on Bob's computer. Oops, helps if I type properly. We are now Bob for all intents and purposes on that computer. So what we did was we put too much data into a random login prompt. And now we can use that to actually own the computer. I can do whatever I want to. I can see what's on Bob's desktop. Bob is not a very busy person. Um, <laughs> but with certain other payloads, we could make calc pop up on his desktop. That's a pretty, pretty common one if you've ever popped calc on a computer. That's a pretty common one. Or we could do whatever we want. We could put a interpreter shell on there. We could put a bot on there or something like that. It doesn't really matter because we can do whatever we want. Now, if Bob is doing some important work, well, that's just a shame because Bob is no longer doing his important work. So we can do stuff like that. And that's what we can do if we have control over that. So now, uh, I forgot a couple slides here. Uh, this is what the debugger looks like when you're uh, looking at it in, uh, this is, whoops, this is immunity debugger. Um, so as you can see, after the crash, this is pointing at a certain memory address, and this is what's in that address. And it's just going, ah, it's yelling at us. It's not very happy because we made it unhappy. And you look here at EIP, that's the register I said was very important because that's the register that tells the CPU what instruction to execute next. The CPU tries to execute AAAA, and it doesn't know how to execute AAAA. That doesn't mean anything to the CPU. So that's why we get the crash when we put that there. And uh, I showed you the script that helps you find the offset. Uh, we generated the payload. You would find that payload right in here, and you would um, plug that into a tool that tells you where in the, in the string the payload wound up, and it will show you the exact offset you need, which in this case was 524 bytes. And that's how you determine the control of the registers. Control of the registers is the most important thing when you're exploiting, because that's what lets you actually control the computer. So after that, we uh, generated a payload that was the um, that was this that gave us just a regular uh, reverse shell. It just dropped us a shell to our listener. Um, we generated that payload and injected it directly into what was executing on that computer. So then we had control. We tested it, um, and then sometimes it won't work. Sometimes you'll get detected by antivirus. Sometimes you will get uh, random errors that you don't know why they're happening, and it's 3 a.m., and you're too sick of it to do anything, and you try it the next morning, and it works for some strange reason. Um, and so you'll need to modify it a lot when you're working on it. There's thing, uh, depending on what you find you will have bad characters. Um, I think I have more slides on it. Yeah, so <laughs> I got ahead of myself there. So first step is um, choosing or creating a payload when you're writing an exploit. You have to, uh, size does matter, unfortunately. Um, you, can't, you can't completely break the process. You can't overwrite too much, otherwise you will wind up uh, crashing it too, 
too hard. You'll wind up with too much of a crash and you won't be able to do anything with the results. Uh, some payloads require a little bit of extra space. Uh, you need an opsled in there in case something is borked in transit a little bit. Uh, things like that. And then you need to encode it properly so that it, uh, you can use encoders to bypass antivirus or IDS or IPS. Um, if you've ever looked at IPS logs or IDS logs and you've seen like shell code detected, that's why uh, we need to encode it because Snort, Suricata, um, they will see things like that flowing across the network unless you encode it. Um, there are encoders that will uh, generate um, self-modifying code that will automatically unpack itself once it's on the box, but it looks inconspicuous until then. There are encoders that will only use alphanumeric characters, some that will only use uppercase alpha, uh, alphabet characters, things like that. And it can also help you prevent errors in transit in case there are um, things getting in the way of your transport mechanism. If you're trying to uh, exploit certain network services, they will do things with the data depending on um, what what you have to transit to get that to get through there if you're trying to bypass like a WAF or if you're trying to um, go through a proxy or something like that it can break and that's what encoding helps with then testing it you need to run it against multiple versions of your software you need to run it against multiple operating systems and you need to make sure the behavior is safe and repeatable because if your behavior is not safe and repeatable I don't think you're going to be hired by your client for the next time uh, if their production boxes go down that's not really a good thing so you need to make sure you're not making their domain controller blue screen if you're writing an exploit uh, you need to make sure that their web server is not going to throw a fit every time you exploit it and you need to make sure it breaks in a in a way that won't leak data uh, unnecessarily or cause too much harm and then you modify it as needed if there's bad characters um, sometimes you will have things that won't that don't like the uh, carriage feed uh, carriage return line feed characters um, so you'll have to in take those out. Uh, if you're using MSF Venom, there are options for taking out bad characters. Some places you can't actually have a space in your payload, which is uh, slash x20 if you're looking at it in a hex. You can't have a space in there or else it'll break or things like that. And then you can modify it for different versions because different operating systems especially will change the addresses that you're trying to write over. Um, they'll change the layout in memory and you'll need to modify it as needed for things like that. And so what did I learn when I was going through and writing this exploit? Because that's the overall theme of this talk. What do we learn by doing this ourselves rather than using a tool to do it for us? We learn that C is not safe. If you try to copy over stuff into a buffer without checking its length, uh, you will have a bad time. You will let me onto your box and you don't want that. Um, it, C is not memory safe. C is not something that you should use if you can if you can use something else, uh, you should. Um, we also learned a little bit about computer architecture. We learned about the stack. Uh, I learned about the stack and a little bit of assembly over the course of this. I learned about debugging. Um, these are really cool things that I didn't delve much into before this. And it helped a lot with learning that stuff. It's really cool stuff. And you don't get to learn this in many uh, schools. That so it's a chance to learn things that you might not in your classes or um, from a book, although I'm sure there's books on this. Um, we learned a lot about exploitation. We learned how buffer overflows work, um, how we can exploit them, uh, how we can use those to gain control. And we learned about finding them. We uh, Originally to find this, I wrote what's called a fuzzer, which basically loops through and sends more and more and more data until the program crashes. And I had to write one of those to figure out where it crashed. Um, so we learned about how to find things like that and how those work, how to use them to our advantage. So in conclusion, writing, your, writing things yourself is fun because it teaches you stuff and you get to spend more time behind a keyboard, which I'm sure everybody absolutely loves. <laughs> or maybe you're not me and you're not crazy and geeky and stuff like that, so you don't love it so much, but I like it a lot at least. And doing things the hard way teaches you more. If you're just using Metasploit, if you're just using MSO8067 on everything, you're just going to 
do the same things over and over, press button, get hacks. You're going to get the same result every time. You're not going to actually learn anything from that. Or if you do learn things from it, it's just how to press a button and how to work with your framework a little better or click the mouse better. But you learn more by doing it the hard way, by doing it yourself. And even if you write your own tools and they suck, at least you're learning stuff from it. My tools suck. I would never use them, uh, most of them. But it's important to have that experience because how do you suck less? You practice more. You do these things for fun, for hours into the night when your parents are yelling at you to go to bed and stop banging on your keyboard. And uh, you learn this by uh, spending a lot of time reading. Reading is fun. Most people don't think so, but reading is fun. And you don't have to use the stuff you write. Just make sure it works. Figure out how it works. Figure out why it works. Then you can be smarter about when you use tools. Then you can make stuff when you need it. And if you need to have something made, but you don't know how, you have to pay a developer a lot of money to make that for you. Or you just have to hope that somebody will make it for you in the future. If you can do it yourself, you don't have to spend that money. You don't have to deal with the developer sitting in the corner sulking with a can of Mountain Dew in his hand. Uh, you don't have to deal with any of that. And you can uh, do it yourself, even if it sucks. <laughs> uh, so then you also get more of a feel for the technology behind it, the, why things work, how things work. Knowing the tech behind what you're using makes you better. It teaches you to be a safer um, red team or blue team person or it teaches you to be a safer developer. Um, if you're a developer and you're still using string copy like that without specifying a buffer length, please leave. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with you <laughs> or keep writing that code like that. I like that. <laughs> um, and it also teaches you that it's okay to use things made by smarter people. I am not the smartest person in this room, I'm sure. And I don't expect to ever be the smartest person in the room. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. But it teaches me why the smart people do things the way they do. It teaches me why they choose to make the decisions they do sometimes. Sometimes I can tell that it's completely irrational because they're doing it in a stupid way. But if I didn't, if I didn't go through things like this and I didn't take the time to learn it, I would never be able to tell. I would just go on saying, Hey, this is a cool tool. And I wouldn't know why they're being an idiot when they wrote it. But it's things like that, that it's the little things that count. So that's basically all I have. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about why you should do things um, yourself, why doing things yourself is important, why it can help, what you can learn from it. And I think that exploitation is cool, so I put a little demo in there. I hope that was a little bit fun. Um, I know that Bob doesn't really do much with his computer, but at least we took control of it for a little while, and we gave him a bad day. Um, in case anybody was wondering, Bob's password is I'm a princess. He likes pink. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with pink. So I guess if anybody has any questions or comments, you can yell at me. I'm a noob. I fully accept that. If I got something completely wrong, if I'm being an idiot, you can tell me. Um, it won't hurt my feelings too much. I'll just go in the corner and cry. You don't have to actually see me crying. Um, so yeah, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, if you want to come up here and punch me in the face, uh, this side, please. Um, otherwise, yeah. Um, so there are a lot of choices. Different languages are used for different things. If you're writing, uh, if you're writing system administration stuff, um, C is still kind of the best choice, unfortunately. Um, there's things like Rust or, uh, Rust or Go are the primary competitors in that space, but they're still pretty new. Um, I'm not really a dev, so I don't know that very well, but I think, um, if you're writing scripts, uh, things like that, it doesn't really matter what language you choose, but if you're writing for systems, um, C++ is better than C. Uh, you've got 
Rust or Go, which do have memory protection and stuff like that built in. Um, so there are alternatives. Unfortunately, Unix is very much still a C operating system. That's still what you use in Unix. Um, so we'll try to get rid of C a little bit at a time, but it's not going anywhere for, for right now, which is why exploit devs have a job. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, on a remote system, uh, that's a little trickier. Um, if you have access to that system, you can do remote debugging. I know a lot of debuggers support that. I've never dealt with that myself, but there are remote debuggers that will send you the program state, and you can look at it like that. Or if it's a system that you don't own, um, poke at it and hope it doesn't crash to a point where it doesn't recover. Um, I don't recommend doing that because that's generally going to affect your customers or it's going to affect somebody you don't know in Japan and they will be unhappy when their TV turns off unexpectedly. Um, but yeah, the, it's, it's harder to do remotely. You really have to have a local test bed for it. Anyone else? If not, thank you for coming for my talk. Thank you for listening to me ramble. I hope it made some sense at least and I'm not completely incoherent. Um, I do this for fun. I'm not, I'm not an expert, even though I guess technically I'm a professional hacker now because I'm getting paid to pen test. Uh, I don't consider myself such, though. Um, I know there are a lot of smarter people, but I, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>